Yes, why yes he is. Jonathan is exactly eight minutes late today. I don't know why the restream program wouldn't work, but I think I have it. Maybe operator error on my end, maybe uh, error on the site's problem. Who knows? It doesn't really matter. Excuses are for losers. There's a good quote. Whoever's clipping these quotes. Excuses are for losers. Something a lot of people don't um, fully comprehend in most spaces is that while there are certainly outside influences that cause you to mess up, fail, lose, whatever, at the end of the day, it kind of falls on you. There's a poker player a long time ago who was having a tough time in the high stakes games. And he said something to the effect of, look, I looked at my, res I looked at my results. I have good data because I'm playing online. And um, I clearly ran worse than expectation. So I, you know, got unlucky. But at the same time, I chose to play the game. I chose to implement this particular strategy. I um, fully realized that maybe I was even playing a little bit big and outside of my bankroll, right? And sometimes, well, quite often it's your fault. It's okay for things to be your fault. A lot of people want to try to push the blame onto someone, something else. And if you're consistently trying to push the blame onto other people and other things and you know things outside of your control, uh, you may find you have a hard time succeeding, especially at a high level. And I want all of you to succeed at a high level. For example, a lot of people in poker complain about bad luck. But in reality, they just don't put in volume. Or they're just bad, right? Remember, all you have to do to win, find a game you can beat, play it a lot, and keep a proper bankroll. That's all you really have to do. Poker's quite an easy game if you just do those three things. But most people do not want to find a game they can beat which is the topic of, the day, of today, how to find soft slash profitable poker games. We have, you know, a few notes on this today. We should, we should auction off these little notes, huh? I have a whole pile of them. Um, you got to find a game you can beat. Number one, you have to play it a lot. Number two. And number three, you have to keep a proper bankroll. Congrats on the new sponsor slash brand. What's my new sponsor slash brand? You've earned a brain fuel? I've been with brain fuel for quite a while now. I like brain fuel. It's like a cup of coffee that hits you all day long. Keeps you going. Have one brain fuel in the morning and I am good to go. Um, so today, let's talk about how to find soft slash profitable poker games. Quick and easy, right? First things first, why are you playing poker? A lot of people think they're playing poker to make money, but their actions say anything but that. If you're playing poker to make money, you must have a substantial edge on your opponents. Otherwise, the edge you're going to have is minimal. And if the edge you have is minimal, you are going to feel the full brunt of variance. Right? And an easy way to get a substantial edge at poker is to play with players who are really, really bad. And an easy way to find players who are really, really bad is to play small stakes. Because... People who cannot move up from the small stakes are presumably not all that great at poker. Now, I will say that there's substantial rake in the small stakes games, right? And you need to make sure that that's beatable. If you're playing a, let's say, one, two, no limit hold'em cash game and they rake $10 per hand, even if you're pretty good, you're probably not going to win. Or if you're going to win, it's going to be minimal. Back when I used to play 5, 10, no limit and 10, 20, no limit at Bellagio, they would rake how much money off the table per hour? They would take $6 times nine. That's $54. They would take $100 off the table per hour. And you play about 30 hands per hour. So what's that? $3.33 per hand they would rake away. Almost nothing at a 5 to no limit game, right? At 10 20, stakes were twice as high and they were raking just a touch more. So obviously that game has the potential to be beatable, right? But if you're playing a 1-2 a game and they're raking $300 per hour, a buy-in and a half, you're not going to have a very easy time winning, right? So at 5-10 back whenever I was playing at Bellagio, they would take how much? One-tenth of a buy-in. One-tenth of... They take 10 big blinds per hour. Whereas at your 1-2 game, they're taking 150 per hour if they're raking highly, as some places do today. Recognize that and realize that you clearly cannot beat a rake that is gigantic. So you must find a game that has a reasonable rake. And I know some people are going to say, at my local casino, they only have, or at my local casino, they only have games that rake a lot. What am I supposed to do? Well, the answer is, 
Either develop a strategy to beat a high rate game or just don't play. Just because a game exists does not mean you have to play it. So many people think that, oh man, my friends are playing the game. I should go play the game. You don't have to. It's okay. It's okay to not play. You do not have to partake just because something exists. Time of day dictates how soft the games are. Of course. Well, actually not necessarily time of day, but the type of people who show up at a particular time of day. So I guess you could say the time of day dictates it, but there's no reason why 10 p.m. should be softer than 10 a.m. naturally, but the reason is people's schedules are different. Different type of people have different type of schedules, right? Um, okay, okay, okay. So you got to find games you can beat. First things first, let's talk about cash games, then later we'll talk about tournaments, because believe it or not, you do get to pick the table slash seat you play in at tournaments to some extent. But first, we'll talk about cash games. You want to look for the party, as was mentioned here by Kobe. Time of day dictates when soft games are. When are people most likely to have a party? Well, nighttime, nights and weekends right? Why do they have parties on nights and weekends? Because they have a job that they work during the week. Turns out people who have a job that they work during the week like to blow off steam on nights and weekends, which is good, which is good. Hmm. Got to fix my, my moo bot. All right. Fix my moo bot. I will do that. Um, so nights and weekends, are usually when to play because if you think about it the people who go out and party on nights and weekends are either like kind of dj any people to begin with or people who have a reasonable job and they work there work it during the week and then they have a bunch of money to go play poker with right which is great it's perfect what kind of people are usually playing poker at um 10 a.m well either the stragglers from the 10 p.m game or people who don't have a job people who ha are devoting a lot of time to poker and uh, those are not really the people you want to play with because you're not going to have much of an edge on them, right? So you're going to find that nights and weekends are the time to play, and you want to make sure that when you go into the casino, you're finding a game where everyone's having a party. I remember going with my father-in-law one time to Philadelphia to play cash games for a day. We were just going to go play for the day. He had a day off. I figured, all right, I'll go with you. I go in there. They have two 5-10 games happening at, I don't know, 3 or 4 p.m. And one of the games is full of kids wearing sunglasses, hoodies, headphones. It was about the um, most lame looking poker game I've ever seen in my life. Okay. The other table was full of people drinking fine wine, chatting, and basically throwing a party. Okay. I get there, seat open at the bad game. Fine. What do you do? What do you do whenever you're at the casino? They put you at a table. It's clearly not the good game. Take a second, think about it. Well, this should be your default at every single time you go into the casino. Whenever you go into the casino, you put your name on, ideally, multiple games on, on the list, right? So whenever you go to the casino, if the games are full, you often don't just get to say, hey, I want to go take that seat over there. Quite often the games are full. You go to the, what is it called? The podium. You go to the podium and you say, I'd like to get on the 2, 5, 5, 10, and 10, 20 list, let's say. Hopefully... The game slightly above your stake is not way out of your bankroll, and hopefully the game below your stake is, you know, obviously that's fine to play two while you're waiting. What you do not want to do is you do not want to go to the casino, and let's say you want to be a 2-5 player. Let's say there's a list a mile long for the 2-5 game, but no wait at 1-3 and 5-10. You want to look at the 1-3 and 5-10 games. If the 5-10 game is abnormally soft, play it. If the 1-3 game is has a seat open, you probably want to play it because you'll presumably have an edge in it if you're a 2-5 player, right? So... That way you don't sit there waiting for an hour, two hours, hoping to get a seat. So many people squander their time going to the casino and just waiting to get in a game, right? Get in a game and play it, especially if you expect to have an edge. Well, if you expect to have an edge, right? So fine, we're in a game, but it's not the game we want to get in. Whenever you go to the casino and you get seated at your table, say, I would like to be put on the seat change, the table change list. Table change list. The floor person will often have some sort of piece of paper that says the players who want to move to different tables. And if you're playing 1-3, let's say, but you wanted to play 2-5, say, hey, I want to be on the table change list for 1-3. And also, if the seat opens at 2-5, I would like to take it. So essentially, keep me on the 2-5 list. Don't take me off the 2-5 list yet, right? You're in the 1-3 game. You had an open seat, but you want to play 2-5. The list is a mile long. They're not going to bump you to the front of the line, but you can stay in your place on the line, and eventually you'll get called, right? When they finally do call your name... 
you need to evaluate. Is my 1-3 game very good? If your 1-3 game is very good, maybe you don't want to change tables. You don't have to change tables. But if you look at the 2-5 game and it looks good, all right, you go play the 2-5 game. Let's say your medium 2-5 game, not great, not terrible, and there's a 2-5 game where everyone's having a party. Ask for be, ask to be on the table change list, right? And as soon as the seat comes open at the party table, make sure it's a reasonable spot for you, better than your current spot, and then go over there. You may say, how do you know? You're busy playing your game. Well, live poker's pretty slow. You can get up, you can move around, and you can walk around and look at the games, right? If they're clearly having a party and your game is just marginal, you should probably go. Now, Nicholas says, always go. Mm, there, here's, here's where it starts to get tough because you have to be able to actually clearly evaluate is the seat at the party table good? Because party table is very relative, right? Sometimes the party table's insane and every seat's great. Sometimes the party table is just decently better than your current spot. But imagine you actually have a good seat at your table and the seat at the party table is like the worst seat at the party table, which sometimes happens. Let's say you have big, good, like good players with big stacks on your left. Everybody on the, the right has shortish stacks and people across the table have medium stacks and those are the ones who are actually partying. That seat may not actually be that good because you don't want big, good stacks on your left and you don't want like shortish stacks on your right because you lose chips to the people on your left in No Limit Hold'em in games with position. So you're going to be losing big pots to the good players on your left. You're going to be winning small pots from the bad players on your right. And you're not really going to get to play all that many pots to the players across the table from you. It's just how it works, right? So that's a spot where maybe you actually decline the seat at the party table. doesn't happen all that often, but sometimes it is set up like that. You want short stacks on your left, big stacks on your right. Okay? So... Typically, though, you want to make sure you are on the table change list. If you go play cash games in live poker and you're not on the table change list literally every single time you go in, if that's not the first thing you tell them whenever they sit you down, you are screwing up. You're leaving equity on the table and it's going to make it way more difficult for you to win. I'm very confident the reason I had a gigantic win rate at live cash games back when I played them all the time is because I always got one of the best seats in the whole room. I was not afraid to go play higher stakes or smaller stakes. Sometimes I ended up playing 2-5, even though the 5-10 games were running and they were okay. But if there's six people at a 2-5 table going off, you're going to make more money playing that than you will at the 5-10 game, right? Same thing at 10-20, uh, right? Sometimes I'd play 5-10. Sometimes I'd play 25-50. Sometimes I'd play 200-400, right? If the 200-400 game randomly starts running, it's because the game's great. Go play the 200-400 game, right? There you go. Don't be afraid to gamble as long as you're properly bankrolled, which I was. So... Table change list. Also, seat change list, right? Whenever you get to your seat, ask to be on the seat change list. They do it at different places at different casinos. Some casinos do it based on seniority, just who is at the table first gets to pick if they like the open seat first at the table. Some places you have to be on a list or get like a little button from the dealer, whatever, uh, depending on your venue. You need to figure out the rules for your venue. Believe it or not, it's important to know the rules of the game you're playing and the rules of poker change a decent amount, venue to venue. So make sure you know the rules of your venue. And ideally, you want to have the first option to change seats. Now, when you change seats, don't act overly predatory about it. Don't say, I want to take the one seat because the player in the 10 seats is super fish, right? Don't say that kind of thing. You don't have to say anything, to be fair. You don't need to justify your actions. But the seat opens. If you want to say, I'm going to take the seat. If, there's, if, you're, if there is no like seat change list, if there's a seat change list, take your chips and push them right over there into that seat because that's your seat now, right? Um, so you need to be aware of that because some seats are way more profitable than other seats, right? Remember how I just outlined, you could actually have a bad seat at the party table if you have big stacks on your left and short stacks on your right and all the partiers are on the other side. But if you can get position on the partiers, you're good to go, you're set. Now this says, the worst is when you change seats and some guy gets your old seat and goes on a heater. You have to understand, the seat is not the lucky thing. Do not think that some chairs are luckier than other chairs. If that was the case, I would have thrown out the chair I'm sitting in multiple times. Do not think that seats are lucky. Realize that there is variance in poker. Okay? So, always get on the table change list and seat change list. And reasonably... I guess jockey is the right word. Reasonably jockey to get the best game and seat in the room because say you're playing 2-5 no limit, some seats you're going to win $150 per hour at on average and some seats you're going to win $2 per hour 
on average, or maybe even lose, if you are a very strong player. Okay? As Mark says, this is a good excuse. If you're going to change seats and somebody's saying, why are you changing seats? Say, I want to watch the, um, the Boston Red Sox on the TV. That's what you have to say. Then somebody will obviously start talking about the Boston Red Sox. You'll say, I don't know a single player on the team. <laughs> I just bet on it because I'm a degenerate, right? That's what you have to say. Um, okay. Let's see. Yeah, play a range of stakes and or games I have listed. This is a difficult thing to do for new players. I fully realize this, but whenever I used to go play at Bellagio every day, for example, I would go get on the list for 5-10 no limit, 10-20 no limit, 25-50 no limit, uh, 80, 160, an 80, 160 limit hold them. And usually if they had a PLO game, the PLO game, I'd get on the list for all these things, right? I would not play the limit game very often. And I would not play the PLO game very often for various reasons. We won't get into it today, but I expect to have an edge in both those games. So sometimes I would end up playing either of those other games for the day. Sometimes I would play, um, five to no limit. Sometimes I'd play 25, 50, no limit. Usually it ended up being five, 10 or 10, 20, 95% of the time. But the other 5% of the time, we ended up playing PLO or Limit Hold'em. Usually, in those instances, the games were amazing. Way more profitable than the current game, right? And that's very relevant, especially if you have proficiency at those games. Now, I've spent a decent amount of my life getting good at PLO and Limit Hold'em because I thought at one point in time those were the games of the future. Back when I was a young poker player, Limit Hold'em was the game that everyone played. No Limit was the game you had to speculate on, which... Luckily, I did. And then, um, I don't know, eight or ten years ago, people thought PLO was going to pick up. And, you know, it never really took off like No Limit Hold'em. But still a game some people play, and sometimes the games are amazing. So I'd spent substantial time getting decent at those games. And sometimes you have a decent edge in those spots. They didn't come up all that often, but sometimes they did, and I was prepared to take advantage of them. In your games, this is most likely just going to translate into playing 1-3 and 5-10 if you play 2-5, Right. Dean makes another point. How shorthanded are you willing to play in cash games? Heads up, of course. Why would you not want to play one-on-one -on -one against a player who you have a big edge on? The nice thing about starting games is that you often get to play heads up with the people or shorthanded with the people who want to get in there and battle and gamble a little bit. People who can't sit around and wait, they want to play. Anytime I got on a waiting list, say I was 20 people down, every waiting list is 20 people down, I would say I'm happy to start any of those games that I just signed up for the waiting list on right now. And I'll say, oh, that's good. This person's going to help me start a game. Let me rake more money from the players. They'd be thrilled. They are thrilled to start new games, assuming they have space and dealers. A lot of people don't want to play shorthanded because they're afraid. They're afraid of variance or they're afraid of shorthanded. Who knows what they're afraid of? But as long as you studied poker reasonably well, you realize shorthanded is not all that different than regular poker, right? If it folds you in the cutoff, nine-handed... It's kind of like they fold you in the cutoff forehanded. It's the same thing. Don't be afraid of that. You should, If anything, you should start games. Quite often, by the way, when you start a game, they don't take rake. Or they take a minimal amount of rake, right? As Nicholas says here, a lot of time at the smaller stakes games, the people are way too tight. Or, or they're way too loose and too insane, right? You are going to have swings, but realize that is A-OK. -okay. Thanks for steering you away from sit and goes. You're welcome. Sit and goes are a great way to make a little bit of money. Not so good for anything else besides practicing final table play. Should you play a game where they rake 10 to $15 at a 1-3 game? No. No, you should not. You definitely should not. Let's see. Are those crazy old guys that believe in lucky seats actually trying to get position on us by using it as a distraction? Um, no. <laughs> the crazy old guys who believe in lucky seats are usually just tired of losing in their unlucky seat. All right, Dean says, if you're on the table change list and a seat becomes available, do you go over and check it out before moving or just move in? Dean, I already, meant, I already talked about this. You should know within reason if that's a good seat or not before they even call you. Okay. What I mean by this is you need to be scoping out the tables a little bit. You don't have to be like, oh, looking all in and like making sure you are well aware of everything that's going on at the table. But you need to realize, is this a good seat at this table? Is this a good table to begin with, right? That way you don't have to like go over there and say, hmm, let me scope it out for three minutes. You will have already scoped it out. Now, I realize in some casinos, like I'm thinking of commerce in LA a long time ago, I'd go there and they'd 
to, to play like 10, 20, no limit, and there'd be 12, 10, 20 games, right? It's kind of hard to know which one's good, but you very often then, if you're a regular or aware of the people who are good and bad, will know which tables are the ones you want to get at or which players in particular you want position on. And if you can look around the room and see that there's a seat open at, I don't know, table four, that's a particularly good seat at table four, the guy comes over and says, um, here's, here's a table change list. Would you like to sit at table six? You look at table six, you know table six is no good because you know all the players, you paid attention. You don't move to table six. PLO is much more profitable than No Limit Hold'em, you say. The problem with PLO and live poker, you know the big problem with it? There's one, actually there's two big problems with PLO and live poker. Is it good to limit your wins and losses? Only if you're bad. Every hand you are dealt, you either win or lose some amount of money. If you're a losing player, you lose money when you're dealt hands. If you're a winning player, you win money when you're dealt hands. So if you're a winning player, do you want to win money? Some people do. Most people do. PLO has a few problems. Number one is the game is super slow. Super slow. You play, I don't even know, like 18 hands per hour at live PLO, which is really slow. Okay? So even if you have a big win rate, you're playing almost no hands per hour. It's a big problem. Um, other problem with PLO is that you're... Uh, quite quite often, the games are a bit of a rake trap. In live casinos where they don't take much rake at all, fine, this is not the case. But in games where they rake a lot, when you get it all in in PLO, you're often 55 56% equity if you're good, and your opponents are, like, not awful, right? And if you're 55%, but they're raking, you know, 3 or 4%, there goes your entire win rate, or a lot of your win rate, right? So you have to be very careful in that. It, and it forces you to play really tight in PLO, which is not really what you want to be doing. Now, PLO Online... I smashed PLO online a long time ago. It was super soft. But, you know, all games get tougher over time. As people learn the game better, the game gets tougher. Chopstick says PLO is bingo. PLO is definitely not bingo. There's definitely an edge to be had. But there are a few very big issues with the game. I mean, like in, in New York City, they have um, home games where they charge 5% rake uncapped. Okay? And No Limit Hold'em, this is barely beatable if you play super weak and tight. You got to play weak and tight. That way, when you get all your money in, you have like a 70% equity or 65% equity. In PLO, though, you can't play super weak and tight. And what ends up happening is you get it all in with 55% equity over and over. But they rake 5% every pot, and there goes all of your edge. Literally, no one wins, even if you are world class. So you have to be super weak and tight in PLO, which is pretty lame. Is online poker rigged? I do not think any major online poker site is rigged in the least bit. That said, unlicensed, unregulated, illegal ones, maybe. Would not be shocked. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Should you play larger or small field tournaments as a beginner? Probably small field because there's way less variance, right? Yeah, you do not want to limit your wins or losses in theory. The thing is, is a lot of people get it in their heads, oh, I doubled up so I should leave. But that's kind of asinine if you think about it, because literally every hand you're dealt, you make or lose money, period. So you'd like to be dealt as many hands as possible if you're a winning player. This type of uh, logic is really good if you're not good at poker. Like if you're bad at poker, you should play as few hands as possible, right? Or none. <laughs> um, I mean, this is going to sound crazy to some of you, but a good way to go and gamble at the casino. Say you're going to go gamble at um, roulette. Let's say you want to play roulette. What's the optimal way to play roulette? If you have, let's say, $1,000 to bet on roulette, what's what's the right strategy to give yourself the best chance to win? To win. Maybe to win is not the right word. Because to win what, right? It's easy to win a dollar. Um, what's the best way to minimize your negative expectation, right? To, to neutralize the negative expectation in a game where you're disadvantaged, assuming you're going to play, you must play. What is the optimal thing to do? Why are sitting goes bad? They're not bad. They're, they're quite good. The problem is, is you can't play them at a high level and make any money. So why learn a game? Why spend a lot of time learning a game where your edge is going to be minimal? Now, the right way to play roulette is to bet one time. One time, period. Not always red or black because you're just going to pay the house edge over and over. It doesn't matter what you bet on in roulette because you always pay whatever the 5% VIG is, right? Depending on how many O's, zeros are. So the way you do it is to take your $1,000 you're going to go play with and you bet it on something. And if you win, you leave. And if you lose, you leave. That way you pay the 5.6% one time and then you're done. But if you sit there and play over and over and over and over again, you're paying that 5.6% over and over and over and over and over again. 
This is why the casinos smash most players because most players sit there and play and play and play and play and play with a negative expectation over and over and over again, and they lose. Because you keep paying 5% over and over and over again, you're going to lose. At New York, New York, they have triple zero tables. Well, shows what they think of the gamblers at New York, New York. It is interesting. I was talking to my wife the other day about blackjack. I don't know why we're talking about blackjack. Oh, because every time she tells her friends that I play poker, they ask if I count cards. And we were talking about how you go about counting cards in live casinos and whatnot. And um, I suppose the answer is yes. <laughs> um, we were talking about how they've made the games worse and worse and worse at various casinos. And it shows, she's like, why don't they just make all the games terrible, right? Because all the small states games are pretty much terrible in Vegas for blackjack now. How do we get on this topic? All the games are terrible in Vegas for the most part at, at um, small stakes, but at the high stakes are still like beatable, right? Because they're still doing two deck games, decent rules, etc. Why are they doing two deck games, decent rules at the high stakes? It's because at, as the players move up higher and higher stakes, they become more sophisticated and more aware of this game's awful for me, right? You can't be paying six to five blackjack at $500 minimum bet blackjack, right? Nobody will play. But you spread a regular game, people will play. And if, you know, 2% of the people or 5% of the people have an edge on you, you just accept it and realize that's okay. Um, going back to roulette, <laughs> obviously don't play roulette. You're going to lose all your money. But going back to roulette, um, people at the small stakes just don't care. People who go to New York, New York are usually decently well-off people, but not very sophisticated. Sounds bad, but it's true. Sorry. Sorry if I offended anyone out there. So... If people don't care if the game is bad for them, why not just make the game bad for them? Fleece them as hard as you can. And that's the logic, right? Problem is, is that's going to result in people having worse and worse experiences. No one likes to lose every time. And when you start having multiple zeros, people don't like it anymore. Is it considered weak to move seats in a high-stakes game of poker? No, not considered weak at all. What do you mean? It's not considered weak in the least bit. It's considered intelligent. You have to pay $1 ante per hand to play blackjack at Foxwoods? Well, that's clearly ridiculous. Okay, what else are we talking about here? Tournaments. Okay, so we know how to get a good seat in cash games. And once you do that, all you have to do is keep your butt in the seat and play a lot with a good bankroll, right? Molly says, you threw it 30% of the time with suited connectors. Is this a good strategy? Check out pokercoaching.com. Look in the tools section. We have GTO charts there. 30% sounds high to me, depending on the scenario, of course. Sometimes you should three-bet them a lot. Sometimes you should call a lot. <laughs> Be purple poker. Dgens play at New York, New York confirmed. Yeah, oh, okay. So we go into this. This is almost getting into like stereotypical stuff. You got to be careful with stereotypical stuff so you don't get canceled. Please don't cancel me here. Um, on the Las Vegas Strip, there's sort of a hierarchy of casinos. You have Aria, Bellagio, Venetian, Wynn, and Caesars. Those are all like fairly... They're like the nicest casinos in Vegas, basically, right? I, I realize some, are, some of those are better or worse than others. At least in Jonathan Little's brain, those are the ones that are the nicest. And to be fair, those are mostly the newest, right? I know they're not actually all that new, but those are the newest. And in those places, you can actually find some pretty reasonable gambling games, right? Reasonably spread gambling games. And you just have to be savvy about it, right? As you go to the lesser, lesser casinos, like, I don't know, Harrah's, Bally's, Paris, New York, New York, Excalibur, places like that, you'll start finding fewer and fewer good gambling games and also games spread at smaller and smaller stakes, right? Like if you walk into Aria, you may find the smallest blackjack game. There's $25 blackjack, which is pretty big. Um, whereas if you go to New York, New York, you'll probably find $5 blackjack, right? Or maybe $10 blackjack. And if you go to um, even a quote-unquote lesser casino, you'll find $1 blackjack, right? And that's because they're catering to different people. But as the games get smaller and smaller in terms of dollars, the rules often get worse and worse for the players because in order for the casino to spread a game, they have to expect to make some amount of money per table per hour, right? So when you're playing $1 blackjack, the rules are going to be awful because the casino needs to make, I don't know, however, however much dollar, many dollars they want per table per hour, Right? Um, whereas at, uh, let's say the high, high roller rooms and Aria, they may have hundred dollar minimum or $500 minimum or whatever it is, depending on the time of day and day of the week. But if they expect to make, you know, whatever, a dollar per hand or $2 per hand, whatever it is, they will, they'll make that at the hundred dollar game, but to make a dollar per hand at the $1 game, you can't even do that, right? You make like 10 cents per hand if your opponents are terrible and 
the the rake is high. The house big is high. Anyway, anyway. Why are we talking about running of casinos? Do you all need to know about that? I know a lot about gambling games. I don't know if you know this. I'm a professional gambler at the end of the day. <laughs> I specialize in poker, but we know a lot about all gambling games. Keep the questions coming for fun. Okay, tournament seat selection. How do you play in soft tournaments? How do you find soft tournaments? First things first, look for games with big guarantees, right? You want to play in games that have big guarantees because as more and more people enter the tournament, presumably proportionally more of those people are weaker players. For example, in your local casino, in your local casino, there may be a hundred good poker players. Let's just call it, you know, good in quotation marks. So there's a hundred good poker players in your local area. Fine. Let's say you're going to play a hundred dollar tournament, 10,000 guaranteed, hundred people. Well, if all the good players go and play that game, well, there's no edge, right? But what if they make it a hundred K guarantee? Well, now they need a thousand people, but there's only a hundred good people in your casino. Where, do the, where are those other 900 people going to come from? They're either going to come for re-entries from the good player, but not all 10 of them because they're not re-entering 10 times. Or they're going to be generally weaker players who are coming in to play in that tournament to try to get rich quick, right? So as the guarantee gets bigger and bigger, you're going to find that the caliber of player gets smaller or gets worse and worse proportionally. Um, obviously, a $10,000 buy-in tournament with a 100K guarantee is not the same as a $100 tournament with a 100K guarantee, right? One needs 10 players, one needs 1,000 players, right? So realize that the guarantee is proportional to the buy-in or related to the buy-in to some extent. But if you if you have a choice of playing like a 100K guarantee $100 tournament or a 10K guarantee $100 tournament, you can be quite sure the 100,000 $100, guarantee tournament is going to be way softer than the 10,000 guarantee tournament for the same buy-in, right? So you want to look for that. You also want to look for a game with a lot of satellite qualifiers. All the satellite players get all they get, they always get their feathers ruffled whenever I say that you are that satellite players are not as good at tournaments as tournament players, but it makes logical sense. If you spend a lot of time playing a game with a very different structure and that's what you've devoted a lot of your effort to, you're probably not going to be as good as people who devote all their effort to the tournament structure, right? You got to realize satellites pay let's say one tenth of the field. Tournaments pay 15% of the field, but all the money goes to the top, like, 0.5%, right? So the goal of satellites is to get in the top 10%. The goal of multi-table tournaments is to get in the point five, top 0.5%. And if you are not incredibly studied and incredibly strong at poker, you're probably going to be making big errors in one or the other game, right? So if someone's a really good satellite player, even a decent satellite player, you want them in your tournament game, especially since most satellite players play, let's say, $10 buy-in satellites to get into the $100 tournament. That makes them essentially $10 tournament players who are playing 10 times the size of the game they need to be playing or that they're bankrolled to play, that they want to be playing, right? So now you have someone who's playing a game 10 times the size that they're used to and they probably not as well studied at it as it as at the... Yeah, they probably are not as well studied at that game as the other players in that game, right? Now, of course, this presumes they're even good satellite players to begin with. If you're a bad satellite player and you spend most of your time playing satellites, you're going to get into the tournament sometimes. But then you're just drawing nearly dead because you're going to have little to no clue how to play regular tournaments and you're playing 10 times your buy-in and that is the exact wrong spot to be. Greetings from the Netherlands. Hello, hello. Just don't play casino games. Yeah, that's the smart thing to do. I will say though, as a professional gambler, your job is to look for edges. How do you look for how do you know if a game is good or bad if you do not um, do the math, right? I'm not saying to go play them, but you should tinker with them, right? Sometimes you find amazing spots. A while back, a poker player found a, um, a video poker machine, $500 max, not a video blackjack machine in Laughlin, Nevada, during the World Series of Poker. $500 maximum bet, okay? It paid two to one on blackjack. That's all they did. Regular game, two to one on blackjack. Gives player, I don't even know, 1%, 1 edge off the top. Now, assuming the game's not rigged, which it's not, it's not, say it's not, it's not, you should expect to win 1%. That means you're making $5 per hand. Click, 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 click. And you can play video blackjack really fast if you're sharp. This guy skipped the entire World Series of Poker and made something like $400,000 until they cleared, until they closed the game, right? How do you know that game's any good if you're not in there um, paying attention, re learning from others, right? Imagine you knew you could just go sit there and make $5 per hand and you can play one hand per five seconds. 
It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, right? And if you're oblivious to these things, then you will not be able to see that opportunity. That said, how often does that opportunity come around? Not all that often. Are you willing to skip the World Series of Poker to collect it? Some people are, some people aren't. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You know what I'm saying, right? You, you have to you have to have some base level of skill in order to evaluate if something is good or bad. And if you don't have that base level of skill, you won't be able to know if it's good or bad. Kind of like I mentioned earlier, when you go to the casino, or when I used to go to the casino to play poker, I would get on the no limit games of various stakes, and I'd get on PLO and limit. If I did not have the ability to play PLO and limit, then I would have missed out on good games that 5% of the time or 8% of the time or whatever it was that I ended up playing those games instead of no limit hold'em for that day, right? The fact that I was sharp enough at those games to realize if that game's good or bad gave me the potential to profit substantially in those games. And usually when I played the games, the games were absurd, right? Okay, tournaments. Back to tournaments. Um, yeah, so you want to play games with big guarantees. You want to play against mostly satellite qualifiers. How do you get to play against mostly satellite qualifiers? Well, you register when the satellite players are signing up. When do satellite players sign up? Whenever the satellite ends, typically. So let's say there's a satellite with uh, 100 people and 10 of those players get seats to the main tournament. Let's say you know it's going to end at about 11 p.m. Well, right around 11 p.m., you need to be there signing up. Because what will happen at most non-very sophisticated casinos is they will sit you at a spread of tables, right? There may be three or four tables that are open at a time that people get seated at. And if you all register at roughly the same time, all 10 of those players are going to be spread among four tables, even though the tournament may actually have 100 tables in it or whatever. That way they don't end up seating people at tables that don't actually get filled, right? So 11 p.m., if you go sign up, you know you're going to get two or three satellite qualifiers at your table, which is great. It's free, literally free money. So you can do that. Um, typically tournaments that run on weekends are softer than tournaments that do not run on weekends. Ooh, let's talk about the World Series Poker main event. Normally, there's four day ones of the World Series main event. Day one, A, B, C, and D. Day one, D is always the softest. Always. Why? Because most recreational players can't justify taking two weeks off of work to go play one poker tournament, right? So what they do is they fly in last minute for day one, D. If they make it through the day, okay, they're in Vegas for a little while. If they don't, they pack it up and go home. This gives them the ability to stay in Vegas the least amount of time, play a big tournament, and um, be able to leave ASAP. Because you don't want to play day 1A, because if you make it through day 1A, then you have to wait like four days or whatever it is before you get to play day two, right? So, recreational players mostly play day 1D. I don't know if this is actually confirmed. I think it is. I first thought it was a joke. But apparently now Europeans can come to America if they... The, the regulations for Europeans to come to America has loosened because of the, the coronavirus, if you're watching this 10 years later. There was this virus that messed up everything for a while. Um, the regulations have been loosened, and now they've added a day 1E and a day 1F. I should probably look into this because it may screw up some of the stuff I have going on. But what's going to be the softest day now? It's normally day 1D. Everybody knows that. Is it going to be day 1D still, or is it going to be day 1E or F? Probably not E. I guess it's going to be F, right? It's either F. It's got to be F, right? So is day 1F the day to play now? I don't know. I had all sorts of events planned around this stuff. So um, I don't know what the softest day is going to be, but i got to presume it's going to be F, and i got to presume D is just going to be like another random day. I have to look at the schedule. There's a chance that they um, have staggered the day 2s to start on like day 1D or E or F. If they did that, then that might change things, but can't count on them to do good scheduling. If anyone has a link to that, feel free to send it. Is this advice for live only? Well, it's, a, it's advice for poker only and other casino gambling games we've determined today. Um, yeah, so for phase events, call them phase events, a lot of casinos do this thing where they have 15 day ones. I know in the bicycle casino, they started a long time ago where they um, had like 20 day ones, 20 $100 buy-in tournaments to get into a $5,000 buy-in tournament or something like that. I don't know exactly how they did it, but there were 20 of them, right? And if you qualified for one, you could play again, but most people did not. It does not make a whole lot of sense to play again. So what people, what you should do is you should play the last few if you care about your bankroll. Because if you think about it, the people who make it through day the first day one, day 1A, often will not play anymore. Presumably, the people who make it through are the better players on average, right? So by the time you go through day one, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, 
all the good players are through already. They've already made day, day two, right? And this is the same thing for tournaments like um, World Series circuit events, World Poker Tour events, etc., where they have day 1A, 1B, and 1C. Day 1C is always the softest because if you make it through day 1A and day 1B, you're not going to play on day 1C. And the people who make it through on average are going to be the better players, right? Or the players who are really devoted to poker who can go there for a week. And those people are usually going to be better than the people who are coming in last minute. So if you care about your bankroll, if you care about having the biggest edge possible in the games in exchange for not getting quite as much volume, you usually want to play the last day only. Okay? Nights and weekends are good, typically. Not always, but typically. Something that does come up sometimes is, um, let's say they have the World Series main event. Let's say day one A is on Thursday. Day one B is on Friday. C is on Sunday. No, no, no. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Day one C is on Saturday. Day one D is on Sunday. Then we have E and F on Monday and Tuesday. Ooh, that's a dicey one. I have to presume Sunday is going to be the softest day because a lot of people can only come in on the weekend, in and out on the weekend. Maybe they take one day off. You want to play on the weekend if at all possible. Typically, the weekend days are the softest, but they've screwed it up with this World Series thing where they have six day one A's. But but like imagine there's day one A on Saturday, day one B on Sunday, day one C on Monday. So Saturday, Sunday, Monday days. Saturday and Sunday may actually be softer in that spot than normal. So it'll kind of even out. Should you stop playing in a game where it's all good Euro players? Well, are they actually good? That's the question. You can be loose, aggressive, splashy, battly, but not be good, right? So you have to figure out, where's my edge coming from? If you cannot look around the table and spot the fish, well, the fish may be you. Isn't that from a movie? I think that's from a movie. That may or may not ever get a sequel. Um, I actually wrote an article a long time ago about how I played like the hand from the hero's perspective, from rounders. It's fun spots. What did the opponent actually have? We determined it was a gut shot. A gut shot with a backdoor flush draw or something like that on the final hand. You all have sidetracked me to death today. Okay, is there anything else I need to talk about? I have a poker coaching webinar starting in 10 minutes. I should probably get prepared for that, huh? We had a fun spot. Action folds to the you on the button. No, 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 not to you on the button. Actually, action folds to the button. 75 big blinds deep. They make it 2.5 big blinds. We're in the small blind. What do we do? Suppose we three bet with some suited connectors, as someone said earlier. And the button calls. Flop comes. 10, 9, 4. What is your strategy? Mostly bet, but some checks. Suppose you check in the button bet small, six big blinds. What do you do? Suppose you call. So it means we did not check raise. It means we did not continuation bet. Our range here is going to be kind of marginal. Turns an eight. Check, check. River is an ace, put it, putting up the back door flush. What's our strategy? What do you do in these spots? Do you play it great? Do you play it poorly? Do we go through a spoiler here? Let's see if I can pull this up real quick. Can I pull this off without messing up? Let's see. Let's see. PC webinar. Boom. There we go. Skill game. I'm going to spoil GTO for you right here. GTO preflop strategy. Three bets this. On the flop. Lots of betting. Lots of betting. Yeah? Lots of betting, but some checks. Where are the checks? Mostly nines. Right? Nines and ace highs. Some tens. Some nuts. Suppose we check and then call a bet. As you see, a load of nines. Some tens. Ace highs, etc. On the river, what do we do? We bet very frequently, very polarized, but tiny sizing in this three bet pot. Kind of interesting. We're going to go deep on that in the poker coaching webinar, especially discussing implementable strategies, etc., etc., etc. That's all going to happen at pokercoaching.com in about eight minutes. Students did the homework. Hope you did your homework. We go through a lot of those spots. Ramalama ding dong, yes. There's a lot, lot, lot going on and only so much time. Some people say I speak quickly, but in reality, I think they just listen slowly. All right, did you get it? Okay, that's me for today. Hope you enjoyed it, where we talk about how to find soft, profitable poker games. Vital skill. Again, find a game you can beat, play it a lot, keep a proper bankroll. Easy game. Easy, easy game. Where's that link for the webinar? Pokercoaching.com. In the homework, it should be right up top. I hope it's right up top. Let me see. Go to pokercoaching.com. We get logged in. 
right there under webinar schedule. Let's see if I can share the screen again. Please work, Peter, please work. Please work. Right here. Webinar schedule. Jonathan Little, October 18th, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Right here. Click it, get in it, good to go. We also have webinar review with Matt Affleck coming up, World Series review, and me and Jonathan Jaffe. We're going to be going through some of his recent hands that he played in the Poker Masters, some with me. He um, has final table two World Series events so far. Good job, good work. We're going to be going through that on October 21st. And lots more stuff gets scheduled, of course, all, all the time. Lots and lots and lots of content at PokerCoaching.com. Check it out. That's me for today. Good luck in your games. Have a great week. Make the most of it. You only have one week of October 18th, 2021. Unless you have a time machine, you can go back. I don't know why you'd want to go back to this week unless it somehow becomes the greatest week ever. I think it's going to be a medium week, but it may be the greatest week ever. I hope it's the greatest week ever for you. Good luck. Have fun. Thanks for being here. And if you like this show, click like and subscribe. I would appreciate it. it costs you literally nothing and tells the YouTube overlords that you enjoy the content. Also, I've been putting out a lot of videos on YouTube recently. We had a few good ones. We had a video blog where I went through my super high roller bowl experience. I lost. It wasn't very fun. If you want to see me in misery, check it out. And um, we also went through an in-depth hand that Dal Negreanu played against Michael Adamo. Fun spot where he called it off, top pair, top kicker, for only 300 big blinds early in the tournament of a $300,000 tournament. I'll spoil it for you. He went home with nothing, and Michael Adamo won the tournament. <laughs> Get a double up on the first hand, you win the tournament, right? All right, have fun. Good luck. Have a great week.